December. I think of snow, holidays and cookies, a new year on the horizon. Resolutions still with the hope of completion. Like many of you, I make those yearly resolutions. And I was excited for mine in 2020. I was planning to have my friends over for a home-cooked meal rather than planning to meet at a bustling restaurant to catch up from our work weeks. I had many cross-country trips planned to visit my friends and family. And I was really excited to start diving into my hobbies and working a little bit less. Well, you can guess how those resolutions panned out. In December of 2019, I heard rumblings that at the time seemed inconsequential outside of my professional life. They were exciting. A new virus? That doesn't happen often. But at this point, I still went about my daily life. I traveled, I complained about the weather, I hugged the people I cared about, and even I had no sense of all that would follow the moment after I first read the headline, it's a novel coronavirus. My name is Dr. Lexi Walls. I'm a scientist here at the University of Washington and I study coronaviruses. I spent my PhD learning what coronaviruses look like, how they function, and what we can do to stop them. I've studied coronaviruses so long that people used to ask, wait, what's the name of that virus you study again? Or that, that virus you study, what does it do exactly? And I always had my elevator pitch ready telling people why I thought these viruses were so cool and so exciting and in need of more research. That there had been two novel outbreaks in the past 20 years, more than other emerging viruses like Zika, and that we had no vaccine or therapeutics at the time. Let me tell you, people no longer ask me the name of the virus I study anymore. In December of 2019, I knew that coronaviruses had pandemic potential, but it hadn't sunk in yet. I was out of town the moment the novel coronavirus was identified. Remember my resolution to work less? Well, I was glued to my computer, frantically searching for any information I could find. And what I could find was scattered. I was clicking on Twitter threads and one-off news articles, and I started emailing my boss to plan what we could do and how to do it. This was early January 2020, and we knew we had to make these decisions quickly even though all we had to go off of was our previous research experience and the newly released genetic code of the novel coronavirus. By the end of January 2020, I called in to a CDC meeting to listen to experts discussing the situation. The first novel coronavirus case in the U.S. was in my home, Washington State. I called in on my way to the airport and listened to their discussions, not realizing that I would be getting on my very last pre-pandemic flight. At this point, we needed both knowledge and therapeutic solutions, and we were setting out to get some. Once the scientific ingredients I needed and I had ordered arrived, I started sprinting, working full throttle with everyone on my team. My experiments were planned down to the hour because time was really of the essence. The pace was grueling, but it was made a little bit easier knowing that the discoveries we were making here were directly affecting the hospital down the street. And while this was motivating, it was also necessary sometimes to forget the larger implications of my work and my day-to-day -day job, because so much was riding on all of our shoulders. When the world is waiting for your answers, you really have to quiet those thoughts and break it down just to your small to-do list for the day, crossing things off as you accomplish them. On more than one occasion, I had to stop and remind myself that every day, we were learning things that no one else in the world knew, but that the world needed to know in order to help the pandemic. I never expected to be a world expert on a pathogen causing a global pandemic. I was thrown into it, just like the rest of you. And I've been part of a team, globally, of scientists that started a mad dash in early 2020, and it hasn't let up since. We've generated so much knowledge and understanding about this new virus not to mention multiple extremely successful vaccines that combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And all this has happened in one year. These vaccines are based on work of scientists like myself 
and those before me that have been doing research on coronaviruses and vaccines and pandemic preparedness for so long and it's all culminating in this. Vaccines really are the best option we have to combat disease, whether against novel pathogens like coronavirus or well-known ones like seasonal influenza. Vaccines are like training wheels for the immune system, allowing our bodies to practice and strengthen against a pathogen without ever encountering it. Do you know anyone who has been infected with polio or smallpox? The answer yes has become increasingly less common due to the near eradication of both of these devastating diseases because of global vaccination campaigns. What I'm going to tell you about today is how myself and a team here at the University of Washington worked not only to understand what this coronavirus was, but we're also working to try and prevent the current pandemic and hopefully future ones as well. And we were going to do this with next generation vaccines. Now, the first question when, that we wanted to answer when developing a new vaccine was, where should we focus the target? We really wanted to train the immune system to dismantle the virus before it ever has a chance to infect you and potentially spread. And when you look at the virus, there is one component present on the exterior that is really responsible for getting the virus into your body, into your cells, and ready to infect you. That piece is a protein called the spike. And these spikes protrude and form a crown around the entirety of the virus. That crown, or corona, is responsible for the coronavirus name. And the spike is what all current vaccines are based on. It's a really good target. But we wanted to focus in even more. And we really wanted to find the weakest portion of the spike and focus all of our efforts there and the immune system's efforts there. The portion we honed in on is responsible for up to 90% of the neutralizing activity and response against coronaviruses. This part is called the receptor binding domain. This is the Achilles heel of the virus and of the spike protein. And we wanted to highlight this to train the immune system to target our immune system against this portion of the virus, the weakest part. And the goal that we set out to do was to find a best, the best target for this vaccine. Once we've picked the receptor binding domain, the next question was, how are we going to display and deliver this portion of the virus to maximize efficiency? I want you to imagine Legos. They're building blocks that can be stacked and fit together in different shapes and sizes. And these different shapes and sizes give rise to different types of things, the things you're building. And those buildings may also serve different functions. That's true of the vaccine we're building as well. And the vaccine we built is made out of just that, two distinct Lego-like building blocks that when stuck together, stick like Velcro. These building blocks, the Legos, are made out of designed proteins, tweaked to function exactly how we want them to. And once these protein Lego components are assembled, they form a structure called a nano cage, and they form a really beautiful repeating three-dimensional structure. These nano cages can further be fused to components of a virus, like the receptor binding domain that we had chosen, and display many, many copies on the surface of the nano cage to present to the immune system for effective and efficient training. Early last year, we started to try and produce and characterize this vaccine. And the first tests were done in the laboratory. Did the vaccine look like we expected it to? Did it act and behave as we wanted it to? And when these quality control checkpoints were passed, we quickly moved into testing the vaccine in animal models. And after a few weeks or months, we showed that the nano cage produces a strong and potent immune response. And this immune response was even capable of preventing coronavirus infection. That's incredible, but that's not all. This vaccine that we've designed is also stable at ambient temperature, is effective at really low doses, and is scalable for large production. This vaccine worked better than we could have dreamed, even though we were the ones who designed it. This vaccine, our vaccine, is currently in clinical trials and is being evaluated as the first of its kind. 
a fully designed nano cage receptor binding domain vaccine. Some days I still can't believe it. The sleepless nights, the stress, all of graduate school <laughs> feel worth it knowing that all of it culminated in this, in a vaccine going to clinical trials and potentially helping a global pandemic. This is an incredible first step for this vaccine platform and I'm so excited to see where it goes. But it's also got me and many others thinking about the future of vaccines and the future of pandemics. What if I told you that we're not fully satisfied just having a vaccine for this coronavirus pandemic? We are dreaming bigger. And part of the benefit of these designed nano cage systems is, is really just that, that they're designed. We can tune and change any component with ease. We can alter the size and the shape and the function of the nano cage to really suit our needs. We can change things other than that as well. I told you how we made a vaccine with the receptor binding domain, but we can also test whether putting the entire spike or other domains on there does better or worse than our current clinical vaccine. And what about all these other mutated strains of the coronavirus that are causing COVID-19 that are circulating today? Well, we can mix and match and put all of these different components onto a single nano cage, and we can mix them all at the same time for one vaccine. And this platform, it's not just limited to COVID-19. We can design a nano cage, for example, against all known coronaviruses, such as those that previously caused outbreaks or those that cause the common cold-like symptoms too. These are the things we're thinking about. And not only does it work for COVID-19, not only are we dreaming about it for all human coronaviruses, but we also have shown that it works on other pathogens like flu, which support the versatility of this nano cage and this vaccine platform. The nano cages are also incredible training wheels and they are so incredible for your immune system that your immune system doesn't only respond to the components that are in the vaccine composition, but they also respond to related diseases as well. It's like when you give the nano cage to your immune system, you're training it both for the known and unknown foe. We can use the nano cage vaccine to prepare for potential future viral emergence that we don't even know about yet. We think with this platform, we can tackle bold problems. Honestly, we're only limited in our imagination. And like I said before, we have our receptor binding domain nano cage vaccine in clinical trials right now. But the work is just beginning. I'm so excited to see how this vaccine and this nano cage platform change our vision of pandemic preparedness. Because right now, the image of a world without a pandemic is truly a welcome thought. Join me in entertaining that enticing thought of a vaccine for pandemic preparedness and know that we and so many others are working really hard to achieve that goal. And we may be closer than we previously thought. Thank you all so much for joining me in dreaming about the future of vaccines.